To help us better understand the state visit and China's engagement in the Middle East, I'm joined now by Mohammed al Zadnari from Hong Kong. He works at the Gulf Research Center and is also a research associate at Silk Road Associates. Um, let's, let's start there, if we can, uh, what Otto was saying. Uh, what comes next is the key question. He said, well, what do you think people there in the region think uh, is going to happen next? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, receptivity to the President Xi's visit in the region. Um, and I think first and foremost in Iran and Saudi Arabia and Egypt, at least my reading of the media reception there and the official statements there, um, is that this will catalyze greater Chinese economic engagement. Uh, I mean, that's really what underpins the whole visit in many ways. Um, that is to say that there will be enhanced investments, uh, that there will be uh, ch greater Chinese assistance to regional economies in many ways. Um, and of course, you have to also put it in the context that this comes at a time in which many of the, the larger economies in the region uh, are entering periods of transition and are also quite vulnerable due to low oil prices, due to the sustained uh, uh, chaos and uh, upheavals that have taken place in the region over the last five years. So the message that uh, that's coming from Beijing that um, economic e economic development will help stabilize the region um, does echo with a lot of audiences there. So we're talking about the economic side of things, but what about deeper diplomatic uh, engagement by China? What role can China play in the ongoing war in Syria, do you think? Um, I think when we're talking about the political front, um, I think there are limitations to how much China can do, really. I mean, since the beginning of um, the Syrian crisis uh, in 2011, um, the Chinese state has taken a very clear position, which is um, to uphold the sovereignty of the Syrian state, to uphold the position that there would be no intervention in Syria. And I think in many ways this assessment was shaped by the events that took place in Libya. Um, where a NATO intervention led to the implosion of the state. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, what's going to contribute to peace in Syria is really an agreement among the great powers as well as the regional powers involved in Syria on the ground. It's not going to be necessarily a mediator that's going to come between the Syrian government and the various factions fighting uh, in Syria itself. So there are really structural limitations to how much China can do. Um, and I think also assuming such a role would be very uncharacteristic of uh, China's diplomacy in the region. Let me ask you about uh, how this is being viewed. How do you think this trip is being viewed there in China? And conversely, how, how is the Arab region uh, looking at it, do you think? Or are they looking at it much the same way? I think there are different expectations as well as divergences with regards to how the trip is, uh, is being received and seen in China and how it's being received and seen in the region. Um, I think in China, uh, the trip is defined mostly in two ways. Um, in many ways, it's an assertion of China's, of course, great power status um, and its you know, growing engagement with many parts of the world. And it's also looked at from an economic prism, namely that um, the, that reaching out and enhancing China's economic engagement with the Middle East is part of an overall larger plan of um, solidifying the expansion of the Silk Road, the Idailu, the One Belt, One Road uh, project. And as you know, you know, for places like Iran, for instance, uh, to Turkey, which they visited last year, are all important logistical nodes um, that link the Asian markets with the European markets. So there's that dynamic there. Um, with regards to the Middle East, I think it's first and foremost seen also in economic terms, uh, but mostly with regards to expectations that China's economic engagement will grow. This is not to say, of course, that there are no political expectations, but these differ from country to country. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's mostly seen through economic terms. So you could say that there are certain convergences, but these convergences are also interpreted slightly differently. You mentioned all important logistical nodes. Uh, he hit two, three countries, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iran. Is one more important than, than another, or are all three uh, key to, uh, to China's uh, efforts in that region, do you think? 
I think all of these three countries are of strategic importance to China, although only two of them really have uh, the moniker of a strategic relationship or a comprehensive strategic relationship, if you will. Um, but each and every one of them has a particular, the important relationship. I mean, for example, Iran and Saudi Arabia um, are both energy exporters to China. Um, Iran is extremely important with regards to infrastructural networks that will hopefully be created to link the two uh, continental markets that I mentioned. Egypt is particularly important with regards to the Suez pathway. Uh, and Saudi Arabia is also one of the largest economies in the region. I mean, it's the only Arab member of the G20. Um, it, it has an uh, and it certainly has a lot of spiritual and political clout in the region. So they're all equally important in many ways. Mohammed Al-Zadari uh, joining us from Hong Kong. Can't thank you enough. Appreciate it.